by its use of some data corresponding to those in the third draft, while differing from corresponding data in the first. The remaining draft of 19 chapters is apparently the first. It only came to light in 1995, totally unknown for centuries, when it was auctioned by Sotheby's, and thank goodness, purchased by Cambridge University Library. In addition to preparing his manuscript on the transit, this brilliant and incredibly active young man began to study the tides. And by the way, there's a very big difference in Liverpool between high and low tides. In 1640, perhaps inspired by Galileo's conviction that they could prove the motion of the Earth. But he died soon afterward, on the morning of January 3rd, just the day before his intended visit to Crabtree. Shortly after, the grief-stricken Crabtree penned on the back of his friend's last letter to him, quote, Thus God puts an end to all things under the sun. Thus have I lost, O oh grief, my most brilliant horrocks. Hence these tears, inestimable loss, end quote. As about much of his life, we have no knowledge at all about the cause of Horrocks' death or where he's buried. Horrocks left a considerable number of manuscripts whose fate and the paths to publication of some of them were complex. Quite a few were taken to Ireland by Jonas, his younger brother, and have since disappeared. It may be that during the Civil War, some soldiers seeking treasure burned some of Horrocks' papers. Some copies of, of Horrocks' manuscripts came into the hands of another Jeremiah, Jeremiah Shakerly, uh, an astronomer, who in a supplement to an almanac for 1651, predicted a transit of Mercury in October of that year and describes a method of viewing it similar, almost a copy of of the method described in Horrocks' manuscript of Venus and Sole Visa. Shakerly also used material from Horrocks' manuscripts to construct his own astronomical tables, Britannic tables, published in 1653, and highly praised Horrocks' theory of the moon, uh, lunar theory. His works appear, that is, Shakerly's works, appear to be the first published references to the achievements of Horrocks. After Shakerly's death, these manuscripts may have remained with a bookseller in London where they perished in the Great Fire of September 1666. After Horrocks had died, however, Crabtree apparently acquired some of Horrocks's papers, including two copies of the Venus and Sole Visa. They were subsequently obtained from Crabtree's estate by uh, John Worthington, a, a master of Jesus College, Cambridge, who loaned them in 1659 to the astronomer and mathematician Nicholas Mercator. Later that year, a summary of Horrocks' Venus manuscript was sent to a noted astronomer, Ismail Bouillot, in Paris. The buzz was on. Bouillot informed the noted Dutch scientist Christian Huygens who then obtained a poor transcription and conflation of the two manuscripts in 1661. That version was a text published by Johann Hevelius in Gdansk in 1662, appended to an account of his observation of a transit of Mer Mercury. And there it is. The final chapter of Horrocks' second draft of this treatise was omitted by Hevelius, because, perhaps because he or those from whom he obtained the text thought it no longer relevant. Its purpose was to demonstrate that all the planets are dark bodies emitting no light of their own. Horrocks would not have paid as much attention to this if Tycho Brahe had not held that the planets shone by their own light. Kepler held the same view until the phases of Venus were seen with a telescope. Uh, that the additional observation of the transit of Mercury in 1631 did not convince Long the astronomer Longo Montanus that the superior planets were also dark bodies 
was also a motivation for Horrocks' inclusion of this chapter. Each chapter of the Hevelius text is followed by Hevelius' notes and comments. John Flamsteed, the first astronomer royal at Greenwich Observatory, commented that, quote, the notes of Hevelius I find generally needless, end quote, and in some instances erroneous. Horrocks' surviving manuscripts then came into the possession of the Royal Society of London, which decided that they were worthy of publication. But before their publication, they exerted some influence in the development of astronomy. Thomas Street, a, an astronomer who wrote for a wide audience, wider audience, published his astronomical table, Astronomia Carolina, in 1661, in which Kepler's first and third laws were clearly stated, as well as Horrocks' improvement of Kepler's solar and planetary parameters. Street's tables were considered the best for the next half century. Street cited Horrocks' statement that he had clearly verified by observation Kepler's third law. Street also used Kepler's third law for the calculation of mean solar distances. Kepler, Landsberg, and others had not. Mercator also applied the Keplerian rule to the satellites of Jupiter and the recently discovered satellites of Saturn. Both Street and Mercator had read Horrocks' Venus and Sole Visa prior to its publication by Hevelius, and so may have been influenced by Horrocks' assertion of Kepler's third law's indubitability. Quote, the solar parallax continued to be of prime interest. The influence of Horrocks is clear here, as Street was the main vehicle for the reduction of the solar parallax as presented by Horrocks. John Wallace, professor of astronomy at Oxford University, accepted the task of preparing Horrocks' papers for publication. Other members of the Royal Society, however, had access to it, as well as other people, had access to them. Robert Hooke, the official experimenter of the Royal Society, presented a paper to the Society in 1666 with some speculations on the cause of planetary motion. He used an analogy with a conical pendulum in which the string and bob pulled away from the vertical was given a tangential push. A similar experiment had been described by Horrocks in a letter to Crabtree in July, in July of 1638 to illustrate the rotation of the lunar apsides, that was the line joining the closest and farthest distances of the moon from the Earth. The rotation of the apsides was also noted in Hooke's description. When Horrocks and Isaac Newton, excuse me, when Hooke, Robert Hooke, and Isaac Newton corresponded in 1679 on the cause and nature of planetary motion, it may have played some role in shaping Newton's thoughts on the problem. Horrocks's work on the tables of Jupiter and Saturn also seemed to have struck a chord with Wallace, his editor. He wrote to Hevelius in 1668, speculating on the proximity of the planets and the moon to Earth as responsible for certain inequalities in the observed motions of the planets, especially of Jupiter and Saturn, quote, which long ago were a cause of difficulty to our countryman Horrocks, as I find from his letters written in his own hand, end quote. Flamsteed later confirmed the inequalities in the motions of Jupiter and Saturn, and as a result, Newton was able to show that these were due to their mutual gravitational attraction. Wallace also wrote to Hevelius urging, urging the study of Horrocks' cometary the theory of comets. Horrocks' lunar theory was quite influential in the latter half of the 17th century. Newton became familiar with it, and it proved to be influential in his own theory. He wrote, quote, not shy about promoting himself, quote, there are many inequalities in the moon's motion not yet noticed by astronomers. They are all deducible from our principles and are known to have a real existence in the heavens. This may be seen in the hypothesis of Horrocks, which is the most ingenious, and if I do not deceive myself, the most accurate of all, end quote. 
Newton adopted the Haraxian theory and modified it to make it even more, a bit more accurate. Newton said, as I recall, that's the only thing that gave him a headache was the lunar theory. For more than three centuries, the achievements of Jeremiah Horrocks have continued to elicit the admiration of successive generations. In the 17th century, he was praised by many besides Newton. By the 19th century, the praise of astronomers and historians of astronomy had not diminished. Many of the encomiums have stressed his genius and originality and emphasized his prediction of the transit of Venus in 1639. Interest in Horrocks has continued to be stimulated by recurring transits in the centuries since his death. But the reasons for the sustained interest in his life and work are more varied than that. The character of his scientific work itself, his youthful enthusiasm, his premature death, the near loss of his manuscripts, of, his la of the fruits of his labors, as well as national and local pride and Victorian sentiment, have all contributed to a continuing appeal. Moreover, in 19th century England, much of the writing on science and its relation to religion bears a defensive tone. The conviction that science and religion were not incompatible nevertheless led writers to stress the superiority of the religious and moral component in, over the scientific in Horrocks's character. In the middle of the 19th century, a number of memorials were dedicated in Lancashire to Horrocks. A commemorative tablet was erected in a church in Toxteth in 1626. And a chapel in Horrocks's memory was built in Hool in 1659. Um, I don't know if you can read it. At the bottom of this one, it says that he was very likely taught in elementary school by Richard Mather, a noted Puritan who, of course, was very important when he moved to New England across the Atlantic. We, we can't be sure of that. I mean, they like to think that. It's possible, but we just don't know. A stained glass tablet of Horrocks observing the transit is also in Hool in that town. Of course, that's not at all the way he looked at it, but that's okay. The only English translation of Horrocks' Venus and Sole Visa was published by Arundel, Reverend Arundel B. Wharton in 1659, based on the Latin text published by Hevelius, accompanied by a gra biographical sketch of Horrocks' life and work. Wharton's translation is sometimes more free in style than necessary and contains a number of significant errors. It implied that Horrocks' thoughts on planetary motions directly influenced Newton there is a reproduction of the erroneous diagram in Hevelius's copy of Horrocks's, of Horrocks's diagram tracking the appearance of Venus during the transit. Um, this was, Wetton just simply copied this from the Hevelius text. What, this shows it, you know, marked off by degrees and, and angles and so on. Remember, it was about five and a half inches on the screen. But Hevelius shows it as it appeared in the heavens, not the way it looked on the screen, which would have been upside down. So that's, you know, another mistake uh, there. Um, there are also se several infelicitous translations in the Watton text. Phillips Landsberg's tab Tabulae Perpetuae is translated as continuous tables rather than perpetual tables. There are references to the calculations of Rudolphi when it's Kepler's Rodolphine Tables, named for Kepler's patron, the Holy Roman Emperor, are being referred to. Watton refers to planetary refraction when what is meant is planetary rays, radii in Latin. To conclude, inspired, well, before I do that, I ought to show the monument to Horrocks in Westminster Abbey. This is, I don't know if you can read it, yeah. This is in the room where Isaac Newton is buried in Westminster Abbey. So uh, they sort of, you know, emphasize this connection. To conclude, inspired by the publication of Horrocks' achievements and the publication of his transit observation, 
The next pair of transits were eagerly observed, as was proposed by Edmund Halley, the astronomer, and others, as a means of more effectively determining the distance of the planets from the sun. The result was a figure for the solar parallax much closer to the present 8.8 .8 arc seconds and the continuing interest in the life and work of this pride of British astronomy. Thank you. Questions? We have a few minutes if uh, anybody has any questions or comments about the paper. I say he was an unusual he was 14 when he entered Cambridge I mean that was rare but not uncommon uh, you could do that and in three years at Cambridge he just he was inspired as I said by an astronomical appendix to a what was a very very popular Captain James was his name voyage to find the Northwest Passage enormously popular in fact, I think it was the source of Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. He, he referred to things like that in the 19th century. How Horrocks did this, I, he, what can I say? We, we don't know. He doesn't tell us, except that there's a marvelous passage in one of his manuscripts of what inspired him. And I don't know how unusual this is for a Puritan, but he says he wants, among other things, why well, he wanted to be famous like Kepler and Tycho Brahe, but he also said he wanted to sort of help demonstrate God's work in the world. You know. But as for the tales of how he did this, um, as I said, you know, he acquired a few, a few books, uh, and, and his acquiring he read probably from library from the library uh, there at Cambridge from the libraries, but. He, he published it as a, right after he got out of Cambridge. He, he published Fen Landsberg's crazy perpetual tables. But how you know how he did this on his own? He's just a, an incredible kid. I mean, what can I say? Are there any parallels with uh, modern astronomy astronomers? I don't know. I mean, I mean it, it, with that, that kind of technical competence. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there are people who are interested in observing comets and they're interested in observing you know, transit and so on. Well, that's fine. They know how to use a telescope and they know how to do this and that. And they know how to use certain software for these purposes. But to do what Horrocks did was really unbelievable at that time. It was incredible. I can't answer better than that. Sorry. <laughs> I have no idea. This is a research, one of my research projects. I got to find out from people who are expert in instruments in that, you know, in the early 17th century, where he would have bought it, you know. And, and some research has has been done, effective research, on the nature of the telescope he used. It was clearly a Galilean telescope, okay, and so you get this reversed image. The um, micrometer had not yet been invented, though. Before Horrocks died, it was, and he met the guy who did it, the young, another young astronomer in the North Country. Gas, was it Gascoigne? Yeah, I don't remember. Another young astronomer who was killed during the Civil War, but he invented independently. And a French astronomer also invented a micrometer, and then you could get very tiny angles through the telescope that you couldn't get without that measuring instrument, and you needed a Keplerian telescope to be able to do that. But uh, I don't know. Yeah. Now, how, how did you happen to get interested in Horace? I mean, what brought you to him in your life? 
my doctoral dissertation, <laughs> which was on, wasn't on Horrocks, but it was on the reception, part of the reception of Kepler's astronomy. As I said, it took quite a while for astronomers to adopt it, and there were pros and cons and why they objected and so on. I mean, he did something, Kepler did something wild, because for 2,000 years, the belief, standard belief was that planets moved uniformly in circles. And here's a guy who says they don't move. They move sometimes faster, sometimes slower, and not in circles, but ellipses. So it took a while. So I was interested in this, and one of my chapters was on Horrocks. And then I said, OK. I said, got to do more about on this guy. So that's how I got interested in him, because he was important for you know, helping promote Keplerian astronomy also, which is why I maybe a little too much emphasis on that here, on his Keplerianism, but it, it was crucial. If he didn't have Kepler's tables and study Kepler and, and all of that, you know, we don't have copies of a lot of his manuscripts that show his correction. You know, he, we have quite a few, but there's a lot we don't have of tables he constructed you know, on his own to improve you know, Kepler's tables. Yeah, uh, there, well, the, the, the earliest English Keplerian I can find is a very interesting gentleman who did a lot of stuff, wrote quite a bit, but perished before he could publish, Thomas Harriot. Um, there's a lot of research been going on on Thomas Harriot, who was clearly the leading scientist in Britain in the very early in the late 16th, very early 17th century. Uh, his patron, by the way, was for some of the time was Sir Walter Raleigh. Uh, Harriet uh, corresponded with Kepler. And just a year after, he, pro he may have, by the way, he got a telescope on his own and may have discovered before Galileo, but he never published this, certain things that Galileo saw in the heavens with the telescope, about the moon, you know, being quite different from what, what it had been traditionally thought to be. But Har Har Harriet um, accepted, like within a year after Kepler, Kepler published his book uh, called Astronomia No, New Astronomy, uh, it, was, it was published in 1609, and Harriet was familiar with it in 1610. He, he accepted it. There were a few others, you know, my, who liked it. Uh, a lot didn't. You know, most didn't. But he's a, he's a key figure. There's no doubt about it. How I, I think I said, you know, uh, Crabtree, in effect, told him, get off your butt. I mean, look at Kepler's stuff. There are a couple. I've seen two copies that, Har that, that uh, Horrocks owned. One is in uh, the Trinity College Library, uh, and that's his copy of that I had on the screen a while ago of, uh, no, I, I don't think I did. Whatever. No, I'm sorry. His copy of Landsberg is in Trinity College Library. But I, I saw a copy, a rare book dealer many years ago asked me uh, if, if the writing on, on, a, on the front page of uh, uh, one of Kepler's uh, more important work, the epitome, um, was Horrocks' handwriting. I said, yeah, you know, it, it, it's, this is. But he owned all the major works, uh, things that Kepler had published from, you know, uh, 1609 to 1627, uh, when Kepler's tables were published. And Kepler died three years later, in 1630. So uh, astronomy was in flux. I, I had used some purple prose in an earlier talk. And I said, you can see Horrocks as a lens through which is refracted all the significant issues in the history of astronomy at that time. You know, and you can because he raised it to so you know the whole business about what causes the planets to move and and, and you know issues like that. That's a question. 
One more. He, he must have been a pretty good craftsman because he built his own transit, his own cross staff, and he was very conscious. I mean, through like you keep reading, he was very careful about accuracy and improving the accuracy. And he, and then, you know, his collaboration with Crabtree would confirm, they say, hey, look, Kepler says on Kepler's tables, Mars should be here at this, but he's off by a little bit from my own observation, okay? So I'm going to make a correction. You know, this is not just one observation, but a series of them, okay? Another reason, by the way, to get back to the earlier question of the reception of Kepler's ideas, Tycho Brahe's observation, 20 years of observations, consistent observations of celestial events, were not published <laughs> until about a century ago, you know, the 20th century. So people would say, well, you know, how do we know that, you know, Kepler's date is right or whatever. So that was part of a problem. But as people began to check out his theories bit by bit, I mentioned Ismail Bouillot, who couldn't stand the idea of the physics to explain planetary motion. But he says, Kepler's absolutely right on elliptical orbits, and he improved Kepler's, he himself improved Kepler's tables a little. This is in the 1620s, so he also improved Kepler's tables. But comparing your own observations to what you have and then making adjustments in the parameters, planetary parameters. Is that? Thanks again, Wilbur. Okay. <laughs>